Uh, well, it's, right. just, it's just not as close <laughs> as I'm looking here. Oh, hold on. Hold on, Dennis. I got to do this. I don't even have a beard either. Uh, <laughs> We have to behave. Okay. Okay, we're ready, Dennis. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Weldon left us another meditation from the Valley of Vision. And I haven't read this, but uh, this morning, uh, at the title of the passage is confidence. So, one of you will be kind enough to read this for us, and then we'll open the floor for a few moments for comments. Confidence. Okay. Oh God, the Lord, very great. My lot is to approach thee with godly fear and humble confidence, for thy condensation equals thy grandeur, and thy goodness is thy, thy glory. I am unworthy, but thou dost welcome, guilty, but thou art merciful, indignant, but the riches are unsearchable, but thy riches are unsearchable. Thou hast shown boundless compassion to me, but not sparing thy son. And by giving me freely all things in him. This is the foundation of my hope, the refuge of my safety, the new and living way to thee. The means of that conviction of sin, brokenness of heart, and selfish fear, which will endure me to the gospel, me to me the gospel. Happy are they who are in Christ, in him at peace with thee, justified from all things. Delivered from coming wrath, made heirs of future glory. Give me such deadness to the world, such love to the Savior, such attachment to his house, such devotion to his servant, as proves me a subject of his salvation. May every part of my character and conduct make a serious and inimical impression on others and impel them to ask the way to the Master. Let no incident of life pleasing or painful, injure the prosperity of my soul, but rather increase it. Send me thy help. For thy appointments are not meant to make me independent of thee, and the best means will be vain without super added blessing. Thank you. Any thoughts? I like that one sentence. He says, give me such deadness to the world. We are not dead to the world. Then. We fight that every day. And I like the first, well, the second line, humble confidence. You can go boldly, but you don't go arrogant. The new and living way to be, it reminds me of the Solomon Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun externally, but look, I'm doing a new thing. You know, do you not perceive it? So the only new thing, the only true satisfaction we have is through Christ. So it's a, it is a new thing for him only. And people, even Christians keep looking think externally but it's it's truly it's truly the the bread and the wine you know the true bread the true the true wine that brings that satisfaction so you know that new why do you think this is under the title confidence the whole passage is under the section of confidence because well your, your confidence is in the lord and what he has done if you have if that confidence breaks you have nothing so i would you like but peter where else do we go where do you have the words of eternal life we can be sure of all the things that God does for us that he listed throughout this. Okay, we can be confident um, that uh, he will complete the work in us that he began. That's right. And building up what Mark, you said, the second paragraph from the bottom, let no incident of life pleasing or painful. That we do well with the pleasing. It's the painful we have trouble We try to have trouble with mm -hmm. Injure the prosperity of my soul. Mm -hmm. Rather increase it. Yeah, these meditations. I mean, this is a lot compacted into a, a few a few sentences here. You could uh, really do a study on the whole thing, but they're very good. I really appreciate these. I want to ask where did this point come? I mean, this. There's a book for a Puritan prayer. Oh, okay. It's called The Valley of Vision. I have a little copy of this letter down that a person gave a friend gave me, but they categorize the prayers of these Puritans into uh, confidence, into uh, you know, a confession of sin, into all the different categories, and you can use them for meditation. So if you're 
And if you're in repentance over something a year before the Lord, you can find a prayer in there that talks about that whole idea. Uh, there's prayers for the morning, prayers for the night. It's, you don't have one. It's, a, it's called the Valley of Visions. It's a nice little, little book. Any other the gospel, yeah, the gospel is all right here. Uh, happier are they in Christ in him is peace, justified, delivered, nor made heirs. You know, I said that the gospel is right there in that one paragraph. It is. <laughs> I've read those and I always say to the Lord, gee, I wish I had said that. But Lord, this is what, what I hear read it for. This is what I mean. But they're very good. Anything else? All right, let's open with prayer as Dennis uh, is going to lead us this morning. And Father, we thank you for Dr. Sproul. Uh, in, the, in the body of teaching he left us, Father, and uh, as we uh, talk about and listen to a lecture on judges, Lord, we pray as always in everything that you do that this teaching would be fruitful for us, that uh, you would clear our minds and our hearts out that we would receive. And thank you for Dennis. Father, we lift him up to you right now. I just want to pray for him. He's not feeling well, Father, and uh, so I just uh, pray and lift him to you that you would bring healing to his physical body and restore him to us. And uh, we thank you for him and uh, all the preparation he does. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Bill, uh, yeah, yes. thanks for sliding that back because I can't see uh, more oh. here. Yeah, okay, that's good where it is. is. Okay. That's good where it is. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to let everybody know, I'm not deathly ill, but I have a problem with uh, my legs and back and standing and, and, and walking. So, uh, I, I, I'm afraid uh, I could fall on somebody and that would not be a pretty picture. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, uh, we're looking at the cycle of judges and, um, uh, today. Now, a lot of this is going to be, uh, uh, old hat to us since we studied Samson and we got a lot of this, uh, about the judges while we studied Samson. So uh, just be aware that you might know some things that RC is going to tell you, which is so, sort of unusual. I, I know very little of what RC ever tells me. So uh, the book of Judges uh, presents the picture of a nation called the people of Yahweh, but seemingly determined to, to negate the appellation uh, if not destroy itself, but the Lord will not let this happen. He has chosen them to be his agents of light and life to the world. He has rescued them from Egypt. He has entered into an eternal covenant with them, and he has delivered the land of Canaan into their hands as an eternal possession. In the five, I'm sorry, this is, I, I cut and pasted this, and that's, I, I, uh, 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 in the, in the final, analysis god cannot let his program abort the mission of grace to the people depends upon the preservation of his people so against all odds and certainly against israel's uh, deserts the nation survives the dark days of the judges the true hero in the book is god and god alone all right here we go I remember when I was a college student that during the summer, I worked as a counselor in a Jewish boys camp. And I was zealous to communicate the scriptures to my campers, but I was also restricted by the ownership of the camp on how much I could say. And so I made a practice of reading bedtime stories to my little campers every night. And their favorite book for the stories was the book of Judges. They would get on the edge of their cots as we would go through the adventures that are recorded in that book. It really is an exciting, uh, rapidly paced, quick moving uh, sequence of Jewish history. The book of Judges, as brief as it is, covers roughly a period of 350 years from the death of Joshua through the end of the period of the Judges, which culminates with the life of Samuel, of course, who whose life is recorded for us in 1 Samuel and not in the book of Judges. But when I think of that condensation of Jewish history in that one little book of about 350 years, 
I think back to the middle of the 17th century in America. Think of all of the history that has transpired in our country from a period of 125 years before the Revolutionary War up to the modern day. If we look at it that way, we'll get some sense of what a wide expanse of time this is that is found in the Book of Judges. The book is called the Book of Judges because it describes a transitional period in Jewish history from the time of the wilderness wanderings up, in time, up into the time of the establishment of the monarchy. And this period is called the Amphictony. Now the word amphictony is one that we never hear, I guess, in the English language, and actually has its origin in ancient Greece. And it described in Greece the situation where instead of having one king ruling over the entire nation, you had a loosely federated group of peoples or cities that were sort of connected by a religious center. And in the early Greek period, that religious center was the Oracle of Delphi that we've heard about in history. And so that period of Greek civilization was called the Amphictony. And that term scholars have used to go back and describe this interim transitional time in Jewish history. And the Amphictony is, is simply a word that describes a form of government where there is no one single center of power, but rather the government exists on the basis of a loose federation of tribe and tribal leaders. So for this period of roughly three and a half centuries, there was no king in Israel, and there was no single leader, such as had been the case under the, the leadership of Moses and later on under the leadership and guidance of Joshua. But rather, the leadership of the nation was committed to unique individuals who were, in a true sense of the word, charismatic leaders. Now, we use that term charismatic somewhat loosely in our culture today, and it comes from the Greek word for gift of grace, and it refers in contemporary jargon to those who believe in being anointed by the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. Well, in the Old Testament period, we see the charismata, or the charismatic gifts, being poured out to specific individuals for specific tasks. We remember that the first charismatics, as it were, in the Old Testament were those who were responsible for the uh, designing and building of the furniture for the tabernacle, that the Bezalel and Oliab were anointed by God the Holy Spirit and empowered by God for this particular task. We know that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Moses and enabled him to perform the feats that he performed. We remember in Numbers 11, where uh, after Moses had been rebuked by his father-in-law for taking all of the responsibility for all of the details of, of organizing, administrating, governing, and being the spiritual leader of the nation, his father-in-law Jethro said to him, the things that you're doing are not good. And God commanded Moses to gather 70 elders, men that he knew were elders over the people, and God said that He would take of the Spirit that was upon Moses and put it upon those 70 elders. And when God did that, as it is recorded in Numbers 11, they began to <coughs> prophesy, indicating they had come under this direct and immediate influence of the Holy Spirit. Also in the Old Testament, prophets were anointed by the Holy Spirit in a charismatic way and empowered to be spokesmen for God. The anointing of kings later on, when they, when they were anointed by uh, or with oil, uh, that anointing ceremony symbolized the coming on the king of the Holy Ghost to endow the king for his particular mission to which God had assigned him. 
So what we have now during this period of tribal federation in the book of Judges is the record of unique individuals who in times of crisis are raised up by God and empowered by the Holy Ghost to perform the mighty feats and tasks that they uh, fulfill. We think, for example, perhaps of the most famous of the judges in terms of being charismatically gifted by God for great exploits was Samson. We think of Samson and his hair and the story with Delilah and all of that and his Herculean strength by which he pulled down the, 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 the Philistine temple and he killed uh, all these people with the jawbone of an ass and th these exploits that were unparalleled in Jewish history. But he did it under the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a pattern that unfolds for us in the book of Judges that I think is very important for us to grasp and because it's so illustrative and instructive not only of this period of Jewish history but of the whole history of the Old Testament and we might even say the whole history of redemption. And that pattern is seen in a refrain that, is, as, that occurs over and over and over again in the book of Judges. And it starts like this, and Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And after we would read that ominous preface, then we would see that God would then raise up the enemies of Israel and use them as a tool of chastisement against his own people. God would raise up the Midianites or the Philistines or the Amalekites or whoever, and these, these nations, these pagan people, would then come and oppress the Jews. And when the people were oppressed, they would cry out for relief and for deliverance from their God, and they would repent of their sins, and it was only after they would repent that God would then raise up one of the judges, such as uh, Othniel or Ehud, the left-handed judge who slew King Eglon, and he took his sword and put it in his fat belly until the fat covered up the hilt of the sword. We think of the exploits of Deborah and of Barak and of of Gideon that we'll look at in a moment, and Samson, and Jephthah, and, and others, later on ending with Eli, and finally Samuel. Well, these individuals would then, you, under the power of the Holy Spirit, would defeat the enemies of the Jewish people and bring deliverance. In fact, sometimes the judges were called by the name Moshiach, which means deliverers. I think of Moshe Diane, who was the heroic general of the Six-Day War in 1967, and uh, he had the name that was often used for these people in the Old Testament, whom God used as deliverers or saviors of the nation. William Hendrickson uses a little alliteration to describe this cycle that is repetitive in the book of Judges, and he, he uses this little alliteration where he has the first R means relapse, and then the second R stands for retribution, then the third R stands for repentance, and the fourth R stands for rescue. This is the cyclical pattern that we read over and over and over again in the book of Judges. First of all, the people commit apostasy. And in their apostasy, as the word apostasy means, they fall away from their fidelity to God, and they begin to worship the foreign gods of the nations and turn themselves over to idolatry. That's what is meant when it says, and Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then what follows each relapse that is recorded in the book of Judges is the retributive justice of God, whereby which 
the retribution comes in the outpouring of God's judgment and wrath against His own people. And under the weight of that retributive justice of God, the people are then brought to a state of repentance, and they uh, uh, bewail their situation and await their rescue when God moves to redeem them through the agency of the judges. Let's look at one of these examples as we find it in the second chapter of <clears throat> the book of Judges, beginning at verse 11. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. Now, let me just pause at this point. This is a grim, grim recapitulation of the history of these people. You recall at the end of the book of Joshua, when Joshua brought the people together for a renewal of the covenant and said to them, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he called upon the people of Israel to renew their pledge of obedience to the covenant they had with God. And the people promised two things, one positive, one negative. They promised to obey God, that's the positive sense, and they promised not to forsake Him. But it wasn't very long until the nation began to forsake the Lord. And this is significant because if you recall the promise that God makes again and again to the patriarchs, when God promises His commitment to His people, He says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. That immediately points us to the cross where Christ cries out in the agony of His passion, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? And some have felt that this was the pangs of Jesus' uh, passion by which He was simply feeling so alone, so desolate, that He had a sense of being forsaken. But of course, God didn't really forsake Him. But beloved, He did forsake Him because that was the penalty for sin, to be forsaken of God. And for us to be redeemed means to be spared from divine forsakenness. And for that to happen, Christ had to take upon Himself real forsakenness. Now, He wasn't ultimately forsaken, because God raised Him from the dead, and as the book of Acts said, that it was impossible for death to hold Him, because it was impossible for the Father to forsake His Son long term. But that whole idea of forsakenness is a very important motif in Scripture, that the covenant pledge of God to those who are in a relationship with Him is, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. And the book of Judges attests to that that even though God chastens His people, He is chastening His children whom He loves. And though they feel forsaken for a season, God does not abandon them. However, the record is that the people forsook Him. That's the big difference between the God of Israel and the God of the covenant and His people. God does not forsake us, but we are prone to forsake Him. And again, what provokes the, the, forsakening, the forsaking of God here in this book is the great desire of the Jewish people to be like their neighbors. God had called them to nonconformity. God had called them to be a holy nation. God had called them to be godly. 
and to flee from idolatry. But that was unpopular in those days. It's unpopular today as well. But we see this cycle occurring when people did what was right in their own eyes, and they forsook the law of God, and they began to imitate the practices of their pagan neighbors. And that cycle does not simply last for 350 years. That is the cycle that the people of God had, have relived over and over and over again through church history. Now we read then in verse 14 that the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, so He delivered them into the hands of plunderers who despoiled them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand against their enemies. And whenever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. The God of Israel is a God who promises both blessing and curse, both prosperity and calamity. And the judgments of God upon rebellious people are calamitous. Now, we have a tendency to have an expurgated Bible in the life of the church today where we want to delete these things that are such a recurring pattern of the actions of God, and that God will bring calamity upon a nation and upon people who forsake Him. Nevertheless, we read in verse 16, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. But they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord and they did not do so. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning of all who oppressed them and harassed them." But this passage that I've just read is repeated so many times, it's like the refrain of a song throughout this book. Again, relapse, retribution, repentance, and rescue. Now, the character and the profile of each one of the judges that, are, that is described here in this book is a fascinating study of godly individuals. But in the brief time that we have left, I want to call your attention to one of them who I think is particularly outstanding, one of my favorites, and that's Gideon. We meet Gideon in the sixth chapter of the book of Judges, and the sixth chapter begins with these words, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian. And then in verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and came to Gideon, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you O oh, mighty man of valor. Imagine that for a, a greeting. Uh, the angel was sent to Mary later on, you know, and, uh, and with this annunciation and greeting. Here the greeting that Gideon, who's simply a farmer, he's not a soldier at all. And God speaks to him through this angel and says, calls him a mighty man of valor. He, he singles him out as a man of extraordinary bravery. Now, Gideon, I think, was a little bit puzzled by this greeting. I suspect he looked around to see to whom the angel was speaking, and he responded, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? How many times do Christians ask that question? And where are all His miracles which our fathers told about us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. 
And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? He said, Oh, Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least among them. And yet God had just told him to go in his strength and that God would use him and his valor to deliver. How can I do it? I'm from the weakest family. And it says, oh, God is saying to Gideon, precisely. Gideon is so terrified by this commission that he can't, he can't believe that God is speaking to him. That's why we read the story of the fleece and God's miraculous confirmation of his call to him. And so Gideon is obedient and he assembles an army to go up against the Midianites. And he has 32,000 soldiers in his employ. And God comes to him and says, you have too many. And he said, see who is fearful among them and send them home. And Gideon said, anybody that's frightened of this conflict, you can go home. And 22,000 went home. 22,000 went AWOL, went over the hill, They're leaving him with an army now of 10,000, an elite corps of soldiers that are going to go against the whole Midian, Midianite nation. And so Gideon said, all right, I'm ready. And God looks at this army and he said, it's too many, Gideon. Because if I put victory in your hands with this size of an army, you're going to think that you did it in your own strength. And then that remarkable story of how Gideon is to pare down his army to 300 men. And then with 300 men, Gideon puts to rout the entire Midianite army in the nighttime battle. And that story of God's redemption again illustrates the point that we read over and over and over again in the Old Testament. Salvation is of the Lord. Amen. Well, does anybody have any comments? Well, it sort of gives you perspective on today. <laughs> I know, I know we're not a chosen nation, but you, it sort of balances out what's happening today in your mind. Okay. I find that fascinating, but I'll eat the 300 men. Next time I go get a drink of water, I'm going to kneel down so I don't have to go to war. <laughs> they just grab the water up. There's the guys who want to take <laughs> I mean, who'd, who'd ever thought about that? You get all these men, you get too many men. I think I said, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, does anybody remember when we were studying Samson, what one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the key uh, uh, sentences about uh, what was going on was? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Yes, yes. Uh, everybody did what they thought was right in their own eyes. And so that was, uh, that was a problem that uh, was faced during that time. Anything else? Well, that's what we're doing today. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, it's, it, it, it was not unique to the time of the judges, um, obviously, because we wind up uh, doing the same thing today, like you said. My, my yeah. grace is sufficient for you. My, my power is my perfect and weakness is the first that came to mind. Yes. And he is dealing today with a group of people, but they're scattered out all over the world. <clears throat> we're not we're not Israel in a little uh, confined area. So he healed, he builds differently in each part of the world with his children. You think about um, uh, the Russian war, you know, and all that they're going through, the oppression. Mm -hmm. 
but there are many, many have come to Christ through that. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's purpose in everything. Mm -hmm. There's purpose in everything. And California, I say this carefully, but California is way, way left. And look, they've had the fires, and now they're having floods, and mm -hmm. they're having too much rain, and not enough rain, and all that mm -hmm. in one little concentrated area. And I surely don't know the mind of God, but you, you have to think. Well, you know, if God is sovereign and He's in control, mm -hmm. He's controlling what's going on, and uh, uh, so He's bringing the floods. And you can basically think of that in terms of, I, I think there's a lot to it of being retribution. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, a lot of that to, uh, to the fact that uh, people are sinful and, and God visits them with uh, trials. <clears throat> so. But you don't see that while you're living. Uh, I'm sure the, the people that lived during the judges, yeah, they went through this. But they had to go back and read the book of Judges to find out how it all worked out. <laughs> and are, are they, is he building up China? Is he building up North Korea? To come down well, on he's us? Certainly, he's certainly permitting it. Hmm? No, it said he builds them. He, put, he hears down nations and he builds up nations. Yeah, there's yes. been a report, I was telling John about it, that the Chinese uh, military is, certain branches of it are double, double the ships, double the equipment, better equipment, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, they're, they're, they're prepared. And ours is going down, down the whole Yeah. We right. can't get the recruitment. Try the recruitment, the numbers, the the weakness. They did a weakness measure with the the Air Force being the force, Marines being the strongest, Army being moderate. Um, but anyway, that our, our our equipment is failing this and that. So yeah, it, it is. It's you can see you can see it coming. Okay, what's your vocabulary word for this week? Oh, that beautiful word. Yeah. Uh, and fictony <laughs> and it simply means that uh it's a uh group of uh folks that that uh group of nations that are together that uh i, I almost think of it as what we have in the united states in a sense we have a bunch of crazy judges that are are, are in washington and and we're a, a group of uh semi-independent uh, areas. So in, in a sense, I think we can look at that and see that, that uh, we sort of uh, reflect what uh, the structure was in Judges. Well, you're you quiet, are, you're, okay, go ahead. Judges. I was just getting to Sorry. say you're a quiet group. <laughs> That's because I am, usually I don't. Um, <laughs> in our constitution, the leadership is distributed. Uh, you know, maybe Moses and Joshua are equipped to be single, to have all of the leadership in, in, invested in that one person. But today, that's a dangerous thing. Yes. You know, our Catholic Church has all of their authority vested in one man. And that man is not perfect. But it's, it's a dangerous thing. I mean, our, our structure of government in the Presbyterian Church is a, a plurality of leadership, which is important. Yep. So that, yeah, that's an interesting word. Okay. Um, between the death of Joshua and Samuel, how was the nation of Israel organized and led? And uh, then again, we know that it was through the judges. And then the technical term for this period is, and everybody said together, and tick, and tick, whatever she said. <laughs> you got her. I'll forget it when I get the word. <laughs> what are the four elements that William Hendrickson identifies that recur in each cycle of the judges? And and remember what we what we. <clears throat> figured out when we studied Samson and what was going on with the judges. 
what ultimately happened, if you recall that. And I think this defines it. What was the first thing that he that he mentioned? Relapse. Relapse, yes. And it basically is is uh, relapse means that they were doing okay and then they went back. So there was a there was a time that they were doing okay, but then they uh, they went back. What was the second uh, R? Retribution. Retribution, yes. And uh, that's when uh, God kind of says, "Hey, I've enough of this, enough of this." What was the third? Repentance. Say it again. Repentance. Repentance. Yes, repentance. And uh, you know, and and you know, we need to remember that repent repentance doesn't mean just saying I'm sorry. It means that you're going to change. Mm -hmm. You're going to change. And then finally, uh, rescue that God rescued his people. Which kingdom oppressed Israel just prior to the call of Gideon? Gideon. Just prior to the call of Gideon, which kingdom was oppressing them? Gideon. Yeah, so there's a problem in the effort. <laughs> Which, uh -oh. Yeah. oh, at the call of Gideon. Yeah. Who was it that they were that they were having to fight? Me. Oh, okay. I, I I didn't quite hear that. And what was Gideon's first act of deliverance? He organized an army, uh, but it wasn't uh, small. Oh. Right. Small army. He got 300 Navy SEALs and took them on. <laughs> yes. It was, special it, was, it was his victory over. Uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> um, Gideon's first act of deliverance wouldn't it wouldn't it have been um, his finally accepting that God was making him a leader? Oh, his personal act of oh yeah okay misunderstood. How does Judges seven? Prove that salvation is of the Lord and the Lord alone. You go up the up to the Midianites with three hundred men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean the whole thing. You know, God uses. In, in as I recall, in most of these situations, God was using uh, small numbers to defeat large armies. And it was because God was showing the people that it was his power, not theirs. Even when we think about David and Goliath, you know, it was a deliverance that God did that uh, David was able to defeat Goliath. And uh, uh, so we see that time and time again, that, um, uh, that God's, uh, God's work is with the few um, against the many. But that's from our perspective, because God directed that stone where it was to go. So it is him. But from our perspective, the same way with the 300. I'm, I'm sure that not only those 300 fought, I'm sure there was a circle of mm -hmm. warrior angels mm -hmm. that interceded. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um. What does the author of Judges imply as the solution to the problem of lawlessness in Israel near the end of the period of Judges?
25 verse 2. 21 25. Yeah, that's a king. If there's no king, then I need a king. Right. Establishes a monarchy, mm -hmm. which will lead to David, which will lead to Jesus. Yep. There was no king. Um, and interestingly enough, um, and Bill, you mentioned it, I, and I, I remember, and I've shared this with uh, many of you, uh, my friend and, and, and David has been a part of uh, our, our class from time to time, that I had a discussion with him one day, and I was talking about, uh, I think it might have, I might have even been saying that I was going to General Assembly or something, and, and uh, David talked about how they have the Pope, and you need to have one person making the decisions. And as you pointed out, uh, uh, Bill, the, the, uh, uh, the head of the uh, Roman church is not perfect. And so you need a leader, you need a head of the church that is perfect, who is Christ. And then you have uh, folks that um, are involved in making the decisions, but it's not made by one person. It's made by by a plurality of people, so that it's 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 not just one person having an idea that might not be biblical or where God wanted things to go because of the fact that one person is is making the decisions. I mean, because even Paul, what what did Paul instruct Timothy to do? Uh, when he went to establish churches, what was one of the first things that he was to do? Point elders. Yes, we are. Point elders. Yes. Yes. Not one elder, but plural. Really? Yeah, Dennis, you can see that if you look in the recent history of the church in the 20th century now, most of the churches and the great ministries that have built up to where they invested everything in one person, it collapsed. Because right. all the enemy has to do is get that one person, okay, and then the whole thing collapse. Yes. And you see, what's his name down here in Charlotte? Um, forgot his name now. Heard the guy that built up this great ministry, right? Jim and uh, the enemy got him. Bakers. Oh, Baker. Baker. Jim Baker. And the whole thing collapses. Yeah. Swagger. It's not good. Even in the local churches, when you have the set man, John and I can speak about this for a long time. You invest everything into that set man. If the set man falters, the church falters. Yeah, you know, I think um, when you think of some of the things that have even happened in the PCA, um, a pastor can falter in the PCA, and that does not end that church because there's elders that can take, uh, will continue on in the role of leadership, even though you might have had to have a pastor removed, or even just when a pastor leaves, and the pulpit might be vacant for a while, um, you have elders that will um, take up the slack, so to speak, so that uh, one person doesn't have all the power of that church invested in them. Um, Plus the plurality of leadership, gives a, uh, an arena of self-correction. So if one yes. person runs off the rail, the other person, you can correct that person, and there's wisdom in, in the group. Yes. Yes, hmm? yes probably. Oh, yeah. In the Council of Many, there's wisdom. Sure. Yeah, it works in government, too. Um, there was a period in the Revolutionary War when all the uh, the men... There were leaders who wanted George Washington to become their king. Right. Yes. And this isn't probably, I don't know how many people read that. I, I just heard of it recently. But basically, he, he practically just, he practically broke down and wept and said, no, that's not what we've been fighting for. We've been fighting to get away from the monarch. Basically, as much as they loved him, he knew the, the risk of putting all the power in one person. Yes. Yeah, he certainly did. I mean, uh, the whole the whole revolution was about getting out from the, underneath somebody that could just make a decision that uh, impacted a, a, a whole nation. And that uh, there's there's uh, 
you know, God tells us that there's wisdom in the counsel of many. So, uh, so we have, uh, we have that. And, and, um, you know, and that, that boils down to every situation that we come across. If, if a business is, uh, going to be successful, there has to be some people around advising the person that's at the top. If the person at the top is trying to do everything, he's going to wind up running into trouble at some point because it just gets, it gets too big. It gets, and it, it gets too consuming. And so the church can be the same way. And, and we saw that, uh, what happened in Israel was, was, uh, was the same type of thing. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And of course, that that ended Judges, but it also was was the theme throughout Judges, as as we found out as in our study of Samson. Or are there any other comments? Yeah, we have that problem today with executive orders, because you have one president giving an executive order and another president canceling it. That belongs to the legislature, which is a combination of men. And now there is a point where you need an executive order, but we've gone overboard. Yeah, you must read the Constitution again. We told you. Oh, I know I should be yeah. that point. <laughs> <laughs> we have failed leadership on a large scale right in the country, and we're suffering from it. Thank goodness that uh in the church uh our constitution in the church what what uh in the pca do you know what constitutes the actual constitution of the pca the bible book of church order the book of church order but the bible oh the 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 word of god and and the book of church order uh are the uh components of the constitution of the pca so we never want to lose lose sight of that uh as as a as a church when you think about the other de other denominations that are out there um how they have invested their authority uh shows that they really are not investing as much in the scriptures as they are in some of the wisdom of men where you you know, in the Catholic Church, you have your bishops and uh, and I mean, I'm sorry, your pope, you have your hierarchy in the Methodist Church, which is a hierarchy of of bishops and uh, that wield a lot of power. Uh, and the local church does not have uh, as much of a say in things as they might have. The Episcopal Church is the same. And in fact, uh, in the Episcopal Church, who is the head of the Episcopal Church? Archbishop of Canterbury, isn't he the one? Well, yes, but there's even somebody else is the head of the church, the defender of the faith. Oh, king. king, the king, king. Oh, now it's king. the king. It was the queen. Um, sure. So even even the Episcopal Church has invested in one person who has really abdicated their authority in the church, but uh, which again is is. Uh, an example of a problem with having one person that uh, uh, is is uh, leading things. Now we're going to get into talking about kings uh, shortly, and we'll find out that there were problems with kings as well. So, any other comments? Defender of the faith came from Henry the Eighth because he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn. And the Pope would not give him permission to do so. He wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon. Well, yeah, and that's so, and that's yeah, and that's, that's when that's when and, the king took took the authority from the Pope. Yeah, but uh, he died a Catholic. He liked he he liked the Catholic faith. But yeah. he didn't want it to infringe. I mean, we have a president that likes the Catholic faith, but doesn't want it to infringe on his life. <laughs> I think that the um the whole the, the art, the the relapse retribution repentance is also on a personal level that happened. That God will do that with us so on a personal level, spirit field, we start to back we call backsliding, <laughs> um, that relapse, backsliding, and then 
or if it, or it may not even be anything we're doing necessarily that's simple, but it's a maturity that he's trying to um, achieve in us, and that he's an you know he wants to make us image bearers, right? So we're going. He says he sends the adversity, he sends the bread of affliction. That when you go through the waters, you know you won't drown. When you go through the fire, he sends these things. I think it's very, very, very specific about that to mature us even. Or if we are caught in a sin, maybe even something we don't know we're doing, um, you know, that's that can get real blurry because a lot of times we don't know. And sometimes it's just a matter of just achieving maturity if Jesus had to even mature, even without sin. So um, those kind of things happen on a personal level too. You know, he will sometimes he will allow that oppression. He'll allow those things, um, like R.C. was saying, so that we cry out to God, we draw closer to him. Because when we get closer to him, obviously we're going we're gonna to become more like him. We're going to trust him. Our faith is going to grow. So those things are on a personal level as well as our country. Well, I, I don't know how the church is going to deal with the morale in our country. If you can't, if you can't define something, I don't know how you deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pastors are afraid to preach against it because they're afraid to lose people. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we are out of time. I don't know if you if the bell has rung because I can't hear it, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, yes, almost, yes, it's almost it's almost absolutely. <laughs> it's almost 10 45 so margie is leaving because she's got to go sing in the choir and uh tell them, tell them i'm sorry that i can't be there today um and john we sure are, are glad to have you here today i wish i could have recognized you when you first came in um uh, uh, no i i'm, I'm sorry i he's hiding no, no, you I, know I'm, what? I'm happy to be here and, and no problem. Yeah. The picture is the picture is so small on the camera that I can't really make out faces very well. So that's uh, that's the reason. Um, but uh, I'm glad that I was able to uh, do this today so that we can just stay on track. And uh, I appreciate your indulgence uh, in in this. Um, I appreciate your week, background, Dennis. Is wonderful. <laughs> well, very <laughs> impressive. Well, as as um, you can when you're doing uh, these videos, you can put up a virtual background. So I went and found this picture <laughs> of books. Uh, in a library because it looks so uh, professorial. <laughs> and uh, so I use that. One of the reasons is I do a video call uh, every week. And um, if I don't have that up there, Marilyn's walking around in the background and it can be distracting to the people that, that are watching. And, and uh, uh, so- She I, would I look much better than those books. <laughs> well, I think all it looks like she's sneaking around behind me because she's walking from the kitchen through the living room you know and stuff and then she goes down the steps and out the door so it just uh is is less distracting this way but i uh, appreciate you all and uh, let's close with prayer our gracious <laughs> heavenly father uh we thank you for, again for the teaching that rc brings to us and uh, how he unpacks things in a way that uh, uh, is just so outstanding and so amazing uh, to me uh, to find the nuances that he finds uh, that uh, have such meaning. And so, Lord, we pray as, as we consider leadership, particularly that's what we're talking about here in Judges in a, great, in a, in a particular way, that our leaders might uh, constantly be seeking your face, just as we did in the uh, 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 men's devotion this morning. Help us to uh, put Christ first and serve Christ. That's all we need. So we thank you, Lord. We pray that as, 
as uh, the folks go to worship, that they would be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray for Steve and for uh, Mark as they lead the service. Uh, 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 may they, uh, may Steve bring the word to us in a in a concise and a in a vital way. And uh, as Mark leads the liturgy, may he lead us in a way that uh, draws us closer to you. Lord, we thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Dennis, what do I have to do? Just turn the TV off here? Um, just use, uh, yeah, just use the uh, TV one and shut it down. Okay. Yeah. All right, my friend. Thank you again. All right. See you later. Thanks. 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 Thanks.